Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business today is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I prefer short and succinct questions and answers where possible, please. Question one, Siobhan McMahon. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason it is delaying publishing details of the draft budget. Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, the UK spending review will not be published until the 25th of November 2015, and we will therefore not know what block grant is available to Scottish ministers and delivery partners until that date. Under the current devolution settlement, around 80% of the Scottish budget is directly determined by decisions taken in Westminster and the application of the Barnett formula. This means that we have no alternative but to await the outcome of the UK spending review before publishing the draft budget. This has, of course, happened before, with the draft budget in Scotland delayed with the agreement of the Scottish Parliament at both of the last two UK spending reviews in 2007 and 2010. And Scotland is not unique in being placed in this situation. Wales and Northern Ireland face the same problem. That is why on the 21st of August, Jane Hutt, Arlene Foster and I wrote jointly to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury to express our dissatisfaction at his failure to consult with the devolved administrations before the Chancellor's announcement. Thank you. Siobhan McMahon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, and I am sure the Cabinet Secretary will agree that any delay in publishing the details of the draft budget will have a serious knock-on effect for our local authorities and other public service partners. I understand COSLA have already stated that, in terms of financial planning and decision-making, this is not the ideal situation. It is also vital that there is sufficient time to properly scrutinise the draft budget proposals, particularly now given that the Scottish Government shall be able to set a Scottish rate of income tax for the first time. What reassurances and certainty can the Cabinet Secretary provide to those who deliver our crucial public services like our schools, hospitals and social care, who have been kept in the dark and unable to plan their own budgets for the next year? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I certainly acknowledge that the situation is not ideal, but it is not a situation of my making. Uh, the, uh, we are dependent, as I said in my first answer, on the UK Government's decisions for around 80 per cent of the Scottish budget. So I think it would be premature and foolish for us to publish a budget before we had that information. I am pretty sure that position would be understood by our social partners. Indeed, I welcome the approach taken by COSLA in this respect. I thought COSLA's response to uh, the timetable time for the, of the likely budget um, was uh, an entirely understandable and pragmatic response. In relation to parliamentary scrutiny, that is, of course, a matter for parliamentary committees to determine. It is not for me to determine. But I will, as always, as I have done throughout uh, my tenure as Finance Secretary, make myself and other ministers available to interact with parliamentary committees in any way they choose to scrutinise the government's budget. Thanks. John Mason. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary agrees with me that what this shows fundamentally is that the Westminster budget system is hopelessly out of date, it lacks respect for the Scottish Parliament and the other parliaments, and needs to be seriously improved. One of the key points that I would make to Mr Mason is obviously it is up to Westminster to decide on its budget process. It is not a matter for me. But the one point I would make is the fact that this d demonstrates that the scrutiny that is exercised habitually in this Parliament over financial issues is significantly greater and more complex and more thorough. And I make no complaint about that. I think it is a good thing than is the case in Westminster. So I think it's, uh, the, the, the arrangements are entirely out of kilter because of that fact. Um, and uh, I certainly hope that uh, and we can make available as much opportunity as we can for this parliament to scrutinise the government's budget when it's published. Thanks. Question two, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the potential economic impact on the area, what discussions it is having with Havelock Europa regarding potential job losses in Fife? Minister Fergus Ewing. Uh, I share the member's concern regarding developments in, in Havelock Europa and the potential impact this will have on employees, their families and on communities uh, across Fife. I can confirm when the announcement was made we immediately contacted the company to offer support for affected employees through our PACE initiative. Our main economic development agency in the area, Scottish Enterprise, met with the company on Thursday 3rd September to discuss, to discuss support for the business to minimise any negative impact uh, of the job losses. Thank you. Claire Baker. Um, I welcome the Minister's response and the support that has been offered. Um, Havelock Europa's announcement is another major blow to the Fife economy with the recent closure of Tesco's in Kirkcaldy and also 
Tullis Russell um, and also job losses at BIFAB. And I'm aware that the Scottish Government has been working very closely with Fife Council in establishing a task force to deal with job losses at um, Tullis Russell in particular. But can the Minister update us today on how many of those who have lost their jobs in Fife have managed to secure further employment or training? And also how much of the money that has been earmarked for the task force has been allocated? Minister. Uh, well, well, first of all, I can say that I did speak to David Ritchie, the CEO of Havelock Europa, this morning, uh, and he confirmed to me that the redundancies will take effect in October. He highlighted that the company currently has seven young people serving out their apprenticeships, and they will not be affected. Uh, uh, in response to the general questions, I can confirm that the Fife Task Force, the Tullis Russell Task Force, presiding officers met on five occasions, uh, chaired by the Cabinet Secretary, uh, finance and, and uh, with a, a, a Fife Council, uh, and it brings together all partners to support uh, economic growth to respond to the serious challenges which uh, Claire Baker rightly identifies. An initial £6 million of financial support uh, has been announced, and the task force to answer the question about allocation has agreed indicative allocations for four strands for supporting the workforce, £1.5 million, supporting business growth of £2 million, community regeneration of a quarter of a million pounds and business infrastructure and investment of 2.25 million pounds. It's too early to say how many employees will have found work, but I can say that PACE statistics overall in Scotland uh, state that 72% of people who are made redundant find work or other positive opportunities within six months. Thanks so much. Question three, Anne McTaggart. Thank you, President Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government when it will take a decision on setting the Scottish rate of income tax. Secretary. President, President Officer, the Scottish Government will propose a Scottish rate of income tax as part of its budget setting process for 2016-17. I am considering the implications for the Scottish Government's budget timetable presented by the announcement that the UK spending review will not report until late November. Thank you. Anne McTaggart. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. The Sunday Times reported a uh, devolved tax expert, Shan Blaine, saying that many Scottish firms offering jobs to people in other parts of the UK are concerned they can't make assurances about tax rate. Can this, influence, can this evidence influence um, an earlier decision to be made? Absolutely. I think people understand that tax decisions uh, are taken at the appropriate time within the budget cycle of administrations. I think it would be, for all the reasons that I rehearsed with Siobhan McMahon a moment ago, that 80 per cent of our budget comes from the UK government's uh, uh, block grant. Um, equally, there are decisions that uh, complement that in relation to taxes under our control, which people would expect to be viewed in the round as part of the budget process. We can't compartmentalise these decisions. There is an interrelationship between the tax that we raise and the block grant that we receive from the United Kingdom Government. So uh, I think it's, it's eminently sensible that we undertake that process as a joint exercise as part of the budget setting process, and that's exactly what the Government intends to do. Thanks. Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you. The Scottish Government's stated ambition is to make Scotland the most competitive part of the United Kingdom uh, as a place to do business. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that setting an income tax rate for Scotland higher than the rest of the UK would be incompatible with that ambition? And the, uh, the, the Government will take a decision uh, on the rate of income tax that is applied in Scotland based on a range of different considerations. And uh, part of that discussion will be about the competitiveness of Scotland as a place to do business. What I'd say to Mr Fraser is, of course, there are a whole range of different factors that influence and affect competitiveness. I would argue that uh, the way that we are able to integrate the economic development, uh, learning and development support that is undertaken by the Scottish Government and our organisations uh, works in a complementary way to ensure that we're an attractive place to invest, uh, which is evidenced by the foreign direct investment assessment made by Ernst & Young, which regularly shows Scotland to be one of the key attractive destinations for foreign direct investment in the United Kingdom, only behind London and the South East. So uh, there's a whole variety of factors that go into that, but the government will be mindful of all of these questions when we uh, come to our conclusions on the rate of income tax that we apply. Thanks. Question four, Dr Elaine Murray. 
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how is it, it is addressing the concerns raised by the Office for National Statistics regarding the transition to the European System of Accounts 2010 and whether local authorities will be fully compensated for any additional costs for their programmes. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, I provided updates to Parliament on the 2nd of February and the 31st of July regarding the ONS review of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. The ONS concluded that the AWPR should be classified to the public sector under the new Eurostat rules and guidance which took effect in September of last year. I instructed the Scottish Futures Trust to engage with the ONS to clarify the interpretation of the rules that underpinned their decision and consider the scope for making contractual changes to the project which could secure the ONS agreement that reclassification to the private sector would be appropriate. I am grateful to the ONS for prioritising this work. They have now advised that as a result of the SFT's further engagement on the substance of their July decision, there are a number of points that they wish to refer to Eurostat for further consideration. This reflects the complexity of the issues with which we are dealing. It will not therefore be possible for the SFT to submit proposals for revisions to the AWPR contract until Eurostat have had the opportunity to respond to the points of clarification that have been raised with them, which is likely to take several weeks. I have previously advised Parliament that while the ONS was undertaking its review, there would be some delays in reaching financial close on a number of projects within the hub programme because of the need to reflect on the ONS's findings. In April, I authorised the SFT to take forward initial changes to the hub model aimed at reinforcing a private sector classification while recognising that further changes might be needed after the ONS had reported. This work is proceeding well. SFT have submitted proposals to the ONS and it is likely they will be in a position to respond by late October or November. I have given careful consideration to whether in the interim hub projects that are currently in the pipeline should be advised that they can reach financial close in advance of the ONS responding. In doing so, I recognise and share the concerns of project partners and other stakeholders. The Government remains committed to the hub programme. However, I must also take into account the risks that could arise as a result of taking projects to financial close in advance of the ONS reaching a conclusion. As a result, I do not expect it to be possible for these projects to reach financial close over the coming weeks. SFT will engage closely with project partners to consider the implications for them, and I will, of course, keep the position under close review. Thanks. Dr Murray. Uh, thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I hear what you're saying, but I don't take any particular uh, comfort for it, in particular with regard to projects in my own area, Dumfries and Galloway Council, who have contractors waiting to sign contracts through the Scottish Futures Trust, uh, for, uh, through the Schools of the Future programme, for example, and actually on one of those projects was actually supposed to start in the autumn this year. Uh, can you provide any comfort to local authorities uh, regarding when the current prob uh, problems may be resolved uh, uh, and what will happen if the delays actually uh, create a, a additional cost to local authorities which haven't been, uh, been budgeted for uh, in their original calculations. Can I say? The, uh, I, I hope that Dr Murray will understand that the decisions that uh, we are having to consider are a consequence of a process of changes to the budgeting system which have arisen whilst these projects have been underway. So many of these projects um, have been under development for some time. Uh, some of them have reached financial close. Um, a whole range of um, SFT projects have reached financial close. Inverness College, City of Glasgow College, um, the um, M8 improvements, a whole variety of different projects have all reached financial close and have uh, taken their course. But we now have these, uh, an, a new assessment of the rules which have emerged from the ONS, and we have to comply with those rules. As I indicated in my substantive answer, we are now seeking clarification from the ONS on some of these points. And such as the complexity, they are seeking guidance from Eurostat, uh, who su supervise these issues across all European jurisdictions. And, of course, there are other European jurisdictions who uh, are similarly affected by the decisions with which we are wrestling. What I can assure Dr Murray and any project partner is that the government is doing everything it possibly can do to resolve these issues as timorously as we can uh, to enable us to reap the benefits of the significant impact on Scottish economic benefit that comes from having a strong pipeline of construction projects in Scotland.
Thank you much, Malcolm Chisholm. Um, my understanding is that both the Sick Children's Hospital in Edinburgh and the Lothian Health Bundle reached financial close between September last year and the ONS ruling. So I'm wondering whether uh, both of those projects will be delayed. And I, I also wonder what will be the financial implications if, in fact, agreement cannot be reached uh, with the uh, ONS and Eurostat uh, with reference to those and indeed other projects. Sorry. What I'd say to uh, Mr Chisholm is that on the um, Sick Children's Hospital that has reached financial close and it is proceeding as a project and I expect the ONS will come to review the classification of the Sick Children's Hospital as part of their forward work programme. In relation to the Lothian Health Centre bundle that has not reached financial close um, so clearly it's affected by the circumstances that I have outlined to Parliament uh, today. Um, what uh, the government is trying to do through the work of the Scottish Futures Trust, and this is occupying a significant amount of the time and the focus of SFT, is to resolve these issues to enable us to pursue the pipeline of projects uh, and to do that as quickly as we possibly can do. Many thanks. Question five, Rod Campbell. Um, to ask the Scottish Government that what recent discussions the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy has had with the UK Government regarding the devolution of welfare powers. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, I and other ministers and Scottish Government officials have regular discussions with the UK Government about the devolution of Social Security. I met with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury on Friday to discuss a range of issues to do with the tr wider transfer of powers. Like this Parliament, we have made clear that we do not believe that the Scotland Bill implements the Smith Commission recommendations in full and that improvements should be made to these clauses at the report stage in the House of Commons. Mr Campbell. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with the former Prime Minister Gordon Brown's reported remarks that the full implementation of the Smith Commission's welfare proposals are being held back by the, quote, dogmatism and resistance of Ian Duncan Smith's Department for Work and Pensions, which seemed determined for there to be a blanket imposition of welfare cuts across the entire UK? Mr Swinney. Uh, President Officer, I uh, certainly acknowledge that it is essential for the successful devolution of welfare powers for there to be um, cooperation from the Department of Work and Pensions. And uh, there are a whole range of different information requests that the Scottish Government has made to the Department of Work and Pensions over a sustained period of time to assist us in the implementation of these powers and responsibilities uh, once, uh, for which they are, once they are legislated for, um, which we uh, are still awaiting uh, that information to be re returned to us. So I do encourage the DWP to actively cooperate with us in exercising, in providing the information to exercise these responsibilities. And of course, uh, that is crucial because that will enable us to take different and distinctive decisions on welfare compared to those of the United Kingdom. And that's what people would expect from a process of devolution. Ms MacDonald. The Secretary will know that in addition to cooperation between governments, the process of welfare devolution will also require cooperation between parliaments. Does he agree that the model of a joint committee on welfare devolution is the right way to go forward uh, and one that is accountable both to this parliament uh, and elsewhere uh, on completion of the uh, current Scotland Act? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, issues of parliamentary scrutiny are not really the business of ministers. It's up to Parliament to decide what it considers to be the most appropriate arrangements to take forward. What ministers in this administration certainly are prepared to do is to be held fully accountable to Parliament for the actions that we take in exercising our responsibilities, and we'll do that in all circumstances. Thanks very much. Jane Baxter. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to review business rates. Uh, Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Um, the Scottish Government is keeping the business rates framework under close and active review ahead of the 2017 revaluation, building on our 20 point action Please plan to deliver improvements for ratepayers. Scotland already delivers the most competitive business tax environment in the UK. We are funding around £598 million of rates relief this year, including the Small Business Bonus Scheme, which alone is estimated to reduce or remove business rates, remove rates bills for over two in every five rateable premises. Thank you very much. Jane Baxter. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that, for that answer. Can I say to him that many in the retail and hospitality sectors, based in towns like Kirkcaldy, Cowdenbeath, Dunfermline, and Alloa and Perth, tell me that the business rates are a major challenge to remaining in the town centre? If he's serious about town centre renewal, will he agree to look at business rates for town centres? Secretary. I, I think Jean Baxter will be, uh, 
should look at the volume of businesses within town centres that are actually benefiting from the existing rates relief regimes that are taken forward by the Scottish Government. If I could cite one example, um, one of the suggestions that was made to me about the recovery from the Broxburn area from the closure of the Vion factory was the removal of business rates for companies in Broxburn High Street. And when I investigated that, I found there was only one business in the High Street in Broxburn that was paying business rates because all the rest were getting business rates relief. So I think there, are, there is extensive support for uh, town centres as a consequence of the uh, reduction of business rates that the government puts forward. I've never, to be honest, found the Labour Party particularly supportive of the small business bonus scheme. It's never been immediately obvious to me that it was something that they valued. Um, but if there's a change of heart going on there, yeah. then it's of course welcome. But um, I can assure her that there are uh, there's extensive benefits from the business rates regime uh, that the government takes forward uh, that benefit small companies the length and breadth of the country. Many thanks. Question 7, Ken McIntosh. To ask the Scottish Government whether the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy will provide an update on what the cost will be of the recent ruling by the Office for National Statistics regarding the use of private finance for public projects. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, my earlier answer to Elaine Murray went through a significant amount of the detail on this question and uh, I would not propose to repeat it here. I reiterate to Parliament that the Office for National Statistics conclusions will have no impact on the timetable or the cost of the AWPR project itself. More generally, as noted in my earlier response, the Government and the Scottish Futures Trust will engage closely with project partners to consider the implications for them of the latest developments. Uh, can I thank the, McIntosh. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank the Cabinet Minister for his answer. In fact, perhaps an issue for you, Presiding Officer, although I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for the detailed answer he gave to my colleague Elaine, Smith, uh, uh, Elaine Murray's uh, question earlier. Uh, the amount of detail that was given in that answer perhaps requires a parliamentary statement rather than just a, a parliamentary question. Um, and certainly there are questions, uh, wider questions about the scrutiny and accountability and of the Scottish Futures Trust. But can I ask, if the, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware in my own constituency that Crook for Primary School and Barhead Primary School in the other part of the authority will now be delayed because of this decision. The Eastwood Health Centre, uh, although it's going ahead, uh, will have to have its contract renegotiated. Can the Cabinet Secretary promise the local authority that any, having encouraged them to go down this route of private finance through the Scottish Futures Trust, will he promise them that there will be no additional cost to the local authority as a result of this ruling? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Officer, first of all, on the question of the procedural points that uh, Mr McIntosh raises, um, in my uh, statement that in my uh, parliamentary question that I answered on the 31st of July, I indicated I would come back to Parliament with a parliamentary statement once the session was, uh, had returned and once I had the sufficient detail to hand. Uh, I don't have all the detail to hand that would inform that statement, but in, in order to give a substantial response to a question that's been properly lodged in Parliament, I gave the volume of detail which I thought was appropriate to, to, to that answer. And I remain it is absolutely central to my plans to come back to Parliament with a statement once the further detail is to hand, and I will do that. In relation to the points that uh, Mr McIntosh has raised uh, on particular projects, uh, as I indicated, we will remain close to individual uh, projects to discuss the implications of this ruling. We want to resolve these issues as quickly and as timidly as we possibly can do, and we will work with individual bodies to ensure that is the case. Many thanks. Uh, question 8, Gil Patterson. Thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Minister, eh, sorry, uh, sorry, I've Scottish got the, Government. Uh, yeah, I've got the, the question wrong. Now. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to increase the tourism in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, a valley area. Thanks very much, Minister. We work with Visit Scotland and industry to increase tourism throughout the country, including Greater Glasgow and the Clyde Valley area. Uh, thanks very much for that answer, the Minister. Eh, may be aware that a group in Claybank in my constituency are endeavouring to be in contact with the owners of the QE2 to discuss the famous Clyde-built ship's return uh, to its home, her home. Can I ask the Minister if the ship was to become available, would the Government provide assistance to the group in bringing the QE2 back to Scotland and more particularly the Clyde? Minister. Yes, I, I know that Mr Patterson uh, and other MSPs in the Labour Party, for example, have pursued this matter. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that representatives from the Scottish Government 
Scottish Enterprise Visit Scotland and Scottish Development International already sit on an officer working group which is chaired by Inver Inverclyde Council to examine the possibility of bringing the QE2 presiding officer back to the Clyde. West and Bartonshire Council, I should say, are also represented. Uh, the group are investigating the availability of the liner. Only once this has been ascertained and its condition taken into account, could a feasibility study be undertaken for potential alternative uses? Many thanks. Question nine, Linda Fabiani. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what cumulative loss to the block grant has resulted from the UK Government's policy on tuition fees in higher education? The Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government believes that access to education should be based on the ability of a student to learn and not pay. And while it is clear that UK Government policy decisions that result in reductions in spending in England impact the Scottish budget as a whole, the processes in place for calculating the Scottish block do not allow us to identify the direct impact of changes in one specific policy area. However, with a reduction in teaching grant spend in England of over £3 billion in real terms since 2011-12, the overall impact on the Scottish block grant has obviously been significant. For illustrative purposes, a population share of £3 billion would represent £298 million. Thank you very much. I would thank the Cabinet Secretary um, for that answer. And does he agree with me that this shows that there are a range of policy areas in England and Wales where a policy decision taken, even if it's one that Scotland is opposed to, like tuition fees, can have a material effect and impact on Scotland's finances? John Sweeney. That, that, that is absolutely the case. And, and one more recent example, which although we don't have all of the details, but I suspect it will turn out uh, like this, is that the United Kingdom government's proposals for an apprenticeship levy will shift the burden of uh, payment for apprenticeships from uh, the, public f the public purse to individual companies. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence of that, the relevant budget in the UK will be reduced and there will then be a consequential effect on the Scottish budget. It is, that is one other reason why it would be folly for me to bring forward a budget before I see the outcome of the UK yeah, spending probably. review in November. So oh. all of these factors are relevant and Linda Fabiani makes a substantial point in that respect. Many thanks. Question 10, Neil Booby. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy last met the Scottish Futures Trust and what issues were discussed? Secretary. I met the Scottish Futures Trust yesterday to receive an update on their engagement with the Office for National Statistics. Neil Booby. I acknowledge the Cabinet Secretary's answers on this issue this afternoon. He will be aware that pupils and staff at St Fergus Primary School in Paisley are currently waiting on the Scottish Futures Trust to deliver on its commitment to fund 50 per cent of a new school building. Both the Council and I want to see a new school in place as soon as possible. Can I therefore ask Mr Swinney to put on the record when it is expected that the SFT will meet its commitment to a new St Fergus School? Failing that, given that St Fergus Primary School is in the most deprived community in the whole of Scotland, could the Scottish Government not provide £2.5 million from other capital sources for this vital project? Uh, the, uh, in relation to Mr Bibby's point, the, the answer is that the Scottish Futures Trust will uh, proceed with these issues um, as quickly as we can resolve the wider classification issues with the uh, Office for National Statistics and now with Eurostat. Um, and in relation to his uh, second point, obviously uh, there is a substantial allocation of capital expenditure made available by the government each year to local authorities. Um, it totals in excess of £570 million, if my memory serves me right, in the current financial year. Um, and obviously local authorities are in a position to take forward capital projects that they choose to take forward. Many thanks. Question 11, James Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what are the implications of a curtailed timetable for consideration of the Scottish Budget? Secretary. Officer, despite the implications of the 25th November UK spending review date being a full five weeks later than the equivalent 2010 publication, the Scottish Government and the National Assemblies in Northern Ireland and Wales were given no advance notice of the Chancellor's intentions. Over the coming weeks, I will continue to press the UK Government for early engagement on the content of the spending review and will consult the Finance Committee to agree a mutually acceptable timetable for this year's Scottish budget process, which balances the need for the Government to develop robust and credible budget proposals and for Parliament to have adequate opportunity to scrutinise them. Thank you. James Kelly. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As has already been noted by Siobhan McMahon in this session, 
The curtailed timetable for publication in the budget puts uh, pressure on financial planners at local council level. And this is compounded in areas like South Lanarkshire by the cumulative effect of three years uh, of cuts of £80 million pounds, um, from you know, Mr Swinney's budget. So can I ask Mr, uh, the Cabinet Secretary if he will be getting out of Edinburgh to meet with councils and see at first hand the impact of uh, previous allocations in order that he, he can be better informed in terms of his financial planning and ensure a fair allocation for South Lanarkshire. Thank you. Mr Swinney. Well, if, 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 Mr, if Mr Kelly would care to peruse the Government website, he will see that I get out of Edinburgh quite a lot. And, uh, I was in Loch Boysdale on Saturday on Government business. I was in Ullapool the other week there. I was in Oban. I will be in Coke Bridge in a couple of weeks' time. No, I will be in Coke Bridge the week, uh, 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 week after. So there is a whole variety. And I, was, I was in South Lancashire not that terribly long ago. So I am very happy to get out and about and to understand the issues that affect local authorities. And um, I had a very productive meeting with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities just last week on issues in connection with the government's budget. Thanks. Question 12, Mary Fee. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many small and medium-sized enterprises it expects to help through the proposed growth fund. We expect a very significant number of small businesses will be helped. Thank you. Mary Fee. I thank the Minister for that very short and precise answer. Can the Minister tell me if the growth fund will include micro-businesses and what allocation of funds will be set aside for micro-businesses? Minister. What I can assure the member is that uh, this fund is intended for small businesses, and of course, micro businesses are small businesses. The fund will provide micro credit finance up to £25,000 in loans, up to, uh, in loans of up to £100,000, and equity investment of up to £2 million. Uh, and it will support public and private sector partners to deliver this finance, generating a minimum of £100 million into the SME finance market over the next three years. I think that's a, a very good thing, and I look forward to working with all members to make sure that we get the maximum possible benefit therefrom. Excellent. Question 13, Mary Scanlon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and the Economy has had with Murray Council and Elgin High School Parent Council regarding delays to the replacement of Elgin High School. Secretary. So the Scottish Futures Trust, on behalf of Ministers, has engaged closely with Murray Council and other project partners to ensure that all possible steps are taken to progress the delivery of Elgin High School. Thank, Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response and the explanation given to the three previous questions on this issue. I wasn't to know they were to be asked. Uh, the new Elgin High School enjoys cross-party support on Murray Council and the need for replacement was identified 13 years ago with the school now well past its serviceable life. The uncertainty has consequences on the agreed budget with the contractor and on maintenance costs of the current building. So when does the Cabinet Secretary think that this project could start and what support will he give uh, should the Council face higher costs? Uh, I have indicated to uh, Mary Scanlon already and to other members of Parliament that uh, the Government will remain close to individual projects as we try to resolve the issues that affect all of these projects. Uh, I should point out, of course, that um, many of these projects are not straightforward. Um, Elgin High School was supposed to reach financial close in March 2014. It was put back to June 2014 because the, the, the school role had to be increased and there was a school estate review in Murray Council which has extended the time scale. And obviously, had the school proceeded when it was given financial authorisation or given the commitment of resources in September 2012, we might not be facing the issues that we're facing today in relation to this school. I have had a letter from the leader of Murray Council and other political leaders in Murray. Uh, I've also had a letter from the, um, the chair of the parent council, um, which I welcome and they'll, to which they'll be responded, um, setting out the details that I've shared with Mary Scanlon in Parliament today. Thanks very much. Question 14, Christina McKelvey. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the Scottish economy is performing when measured against those of EU member states. The Secretary. Scotland's economic growth last year was more than twice the EU average growth rate, and Scotland is outperforming the EU on a number of labour market indicators. 
Thank you. Christina McKelvey. Uh, can I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer? In, uh, today, in the European Commission, the President of the European Commission, Jean Claude Juncker, gave his State of the Union address. And he talked about the collective responsibility of all European member states, not just in a moral sense, but in an economic sense. And he highlighted the fact that Greece and Italy and Hungary should not take the burden of the crisis that faces all European member states right now. He also announced a £1.8 billion emergency Question. fund to help African countries to help stabilise uh, and to fight people smugglers. Will the Cabinet Secretary, Deputy First Minister, tell us what action Scotland will take in ensuring that our economic growth is Europe's economic growth and it helps address some of the crises and the challenges currently facing all member states? Clearly, the developments that we can take forward in the Scottish economy and the way in which we can um, in include opportunities for everyone who lives and works in Scotland to contribute to our economic well-being um, will be the most significant contribution we can make to the European growth agenda. Thank you so much. Question 15, Annabel Goldie. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the economic benefits of Her Majesty's naval base Clyde being designated the UK submarine centre of specialisation with a projected increase of 1,500 jobs by 2022. Cabinet Secretary. It is not possible for the Scottish Government to undertake a meaningful assessment of the decision to bring the new Astute class submarine fleet into service at HMNB Clyde until the UK Government sets out a detailed timetable and breakdown of the Royal Navy personnel and others, including any dependents who are expected to transfer to Scotland. While we support investment in conventional defence capabilities, we are sceptical about the UK Government's projections for future personnel numbers at Faslane, given that previous promises of a major uplift in the number of Army personnel based in Scotland and investment in the defence estate, such as the promised new barracks at Kirk Newton, have not materialised. Thank you very much. Annabel Goldie. Officer, I know that Mr Swinney in character is not instinctively either churlish or acrid, so I hope he can bring himself to share the predictably very positive local reaction uh, to this proposal to upgrade Fastlane, which is a vital economic driver in the local Dumbartonshire economy. And in order that maximum benefit can be derived from this £500 million investment by the UK Government, will the Scottish Government engage in discussion with the Ministry of Defence and with the two local councils, West Dumbartonshire and Agyland Butte, to ensure that road infrastructure and public transport are adequate to meet increased demands and that training and job opportunities for young people at Fast Lane are maximised. Mr Swinney. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that Ms Goldie thinks she knows me so well. Um, the, some of my colleagues are disputing her assessment of me. They obviously spend more time with me. Um, the, the, uh, what I say to Ms Goldie is obviously yeah, I, I've made our position clear and, and Ms Goldie knows it well. We are perfectly happy to support investment in conventional defence capabilities, but we need the detail to be spelt out. And to do that, we need the MOD to set out the, the information. We'll look at it and we'll consider it. I've never found the MOD particularly open with their information, to be blunt, in all this great spirit of intergovernmental working. They're never terribly open about things. So if Ms Goldie in, the, in our channels that she can work out with the Conservative Government can open up the MOD to dialogue, then I'll be happy to talk back. Many thanks. Question 16, Kenny McCaskill. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its plans are for the social responsibility levy. Secretary. <clears throat> officer, the Scottish Government position has always been that we will not introduce the social responsibility levy during the lifetime of the public health supplement and until the economic circumstances are correct. The Public Health Supplement has now concluded and the Government will consider in due course if there is a case to apply a social responsibility levy for which legislative provision currently exists. Thank you. Kenny McCaskill. Uh, given the significant shift in drinking patterns from the on to the off-sale trade, with 72 per cent now provided by the off-sale trade as opposed to 49 per cent in 1994, will the Scottish Government ensure that actions target where the major source of the problem of abuse of alcohol lies? Mr McCaskill marshals the uh, significant pieces of evidence in relation to this argument. Uh, he has uh, a long-standing and uh, much respected uh, reputation for confronting these issues and for leading policy discussion on the question of alcohol abuse and the consequent knock-on behaviour that arises from that. And I can assure him that the evidence that he has cited today 
and the points that are raised as a consequence uh, will be part of the government's consideration of how to take forward this issue. Thank you very much. Bob Doris, question 17. I ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made to mitigate the economic impact of the UK Government's austerity measures in Glasgow. John Sweeney. So, no, so the Scottish Government is taking a range of actions to support people in Glasgow against the UK Government's austerity agenda. We have supported more than 16,000 households in Glasgow in 2014-15, providing crisis grants and community care grants. Uh, working in partnership with local, with local government, 24,000 discretionary housing payments were made in Glasgow last year. And in March 2015, over 97,000 households in Glasgow were benefiting from council tax reduction worth an estimated £1.3 million per week. Thank you. Bob Doris. Uh, I thank the Deputy First Minister for the answer. The economic impact on young people under 21 who may soon be no longer to be able to claim housing benefit under UK government austerity plans will be devastating for many vulnerable young people and may lead to increased homelessness and vulnerability. Has the Scottish Government examined or will it examine the economic impact of this in Glasgow for my constituents and what scope is there to use the housing element of universal credit a new power coming to this Parliament to mitigate such effects where possible in the face of significant austerity? Uh, clearly, the, the Government will look to uh, take all measures that it can to mitigate the impact of welfare reform on individuals in Scotland. Uh, there, are some, uh, there are some very serious uh, implications of welfare reform, and the Government must be uh, mindful of exercising its responsibilities. I think it is, however, important that I exercise or express a cautionary note to Parliament that, um, in my estimation, it will be impossible for the Government to mitigate all of the effects of the austerity measures but the government will act as it has done over the course of the last few years to do all that we can to support the most vulnerable in our society. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And we now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 14167 in the name of Ken McIntosh on housing and wellbeing in Scotland. I'd invite all members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And when you're ready, Mr. McIntosh.